All right. Well, I, th I thought we'd uh, take a little time uh, to talk about one of my favorite subjects of all time, and that's that's the animals. I mean, uh, you think about it. What would this? What would the Earth be like without animals? You know, I, I, I love my, my hikes, you know, going out and uh, doing my, some of my hikes, but it will trouble me if I, if I do an entire hike, no matter how beautiful the scenery is, if, if I don't see some animals, you know, some birds, some chickmunk that hops up on the, the rock with me to eat my lunch or whatever. They're definitely, I think, one of our most loved parts of the creation, most loved parts of the creation. I mean, uh, science is, is important for a person of faith for many reasons. In, in, this, uh, in this series, what we mostly do is uh, confront the, the false teachings of what we call natural science or natural history and show how those same scientific findings can be interpreted in support of the biblical history. So most of our time is spent there and is spent on defending the Word of God. But science is also important for a person of faith is because it's through science that we're learning about God's creation. Now, those explorations are studies of his creation, and, and through them, we can uh, develop a better appreciation of who our God is and what it is that he's provided for us. And I argue that the animals are a big part of that, on what God has made for us here. They're, they're without a doubt the most loved part. Uh, we, they're the part, of, the part of his creation that we've made pets of, you know, and, and so... We definitely love our pets, whether it's your dogs or cats or, or whatnot. We've made pets from such a wide variety. But it is, it's sad that you don't, we don't have much opportunity to see animals these days. I mean, we've uh, destroyed habitat to make, to make our fair cities and roadways and all these kind of things. That To see the animals today, you have to go off to your Woodland Park Zoo or, uh, you know, get a little more adventurous, go off to some uh, coral reef or one of your... Uh, rainforest these days to see any significant numbers of animals and but to be honest we don't even know how many animals there are the range on the number of animal species ranges from 3 to 30 million there's an estimated 3 to 30 million species of animals on the planet the reason why the estimate on the is so high is that the estimate on the number of insect species is so high the number of insect species ranges from 1 to 3, 30 million just number of insects. We have no really no idea. Many of them are so small; they're microscopic, submicroscopic, and you really can't tell how many uh, insects there are. But they're they're definitely the most fascinating part about the creation, the most beautiful part about the creation. We just love watching them. I mean, just there's an elegance just in the way they move alone, <clears throat> and we're of course discovering new animals all the time. This uh, mollusk. Uh, was uh, discovered off the coast of uh, Monterey Bay just a few years ago. Not quite sure what it is. They think it's probably a nudibranch, like one of our sea slugs, but uh, the thing swims as well, so kind of puts it in a, an unusual category. But we're, we're uh, discovering new animals all the time. This new uh, shark was discovered just back in 2015 called the, the Ninja Lantern Shark. There's its name, Ninja Lantern Shark. Called Ninja because it's pitch black, able to... Uh, to blend into its you know, black territories like a ninja. And it's called the lantern shark because it has little mini lanterns. And as on the side of its head right there, you can, uh, you can see them again here, is uh, our, our light emitting structures that we call bioluminescence. They, they emit light. But lots of animals actually in the deep dark emit light. I'll circle them for you right there so you can see those. But a lot of animals down in the deep dark emit light. Uh, the jellyfish down in the deep dark ocean look like, look like flying saucers, flashing all kinds of reds and blues and literally just look like flying saucers on the water. But now we realize that there's a lot more bioluminescence than we, than we knew before. We're able to see some of the bright light emitters, but there are a lot of animals and uh, even micro microbial organisms that emit light below the range of human vision. So we really can, we can't detect it. The other animals or other species of its species can detect it, but but uh, we can't. So by using special cameras or uh, sensors, they're able to see what the the lights that are being produced out there. Well, for me, and I think my most, my favorite part of animal biology was always animal behavior. It was, it was always an animal behavior, and I think the reason for this is that animals are crazy smart. 
I mean, animals are crazy smart. I uh, had, had this guy causing trouble in my classroom. That's, that's not a real picture. But I actually did have trouble with, uh, I, ha I used to keep snakes. In my, I don't have snakes in my classroom right now, but when I did, I had, you know, we'd have to buy frozen mice or rats, or you have uh, parents bring you in rats when they catch them, which I had happen a number of times. And once the parents brought a rat in, that, uh, that escaped my temporary cage for it then quickly thereafter and was in my room loose for a good month till I managed to catch him. It, I don't know how he, he, he did have managed to avoid my food on a number of occasions, but we know animals are crazy smart. You know, if you've been around dogs for any period of time or horses, you know, any of the, any of the mammals, uh, you know how smart the mammals are, but we really don't tend to view insects as being very smart. But the insects can exhibit, have exhibited some uh, fairly complex behaviors. What is called hive mentality. You might know the term from, because uh, they use the term on Star Trek. There was a species that uh, was infamous on Star, Star Trek series called the Borg, and they had a, a hive mentality. Well, a hive mentality is what they describe organisms that live in hives that uh, somehow can communicate through what seems like telepathy or something in the sort. We, we see them exhibiting some complex behaviors and we're not, it's not quite clear to us how they're communicating what's to be done. But here's a good example. This, these are the leaf, uh, uh, the leaf cutter ants. You can't really see that there's ants underneath all those little leaf pieces, but there are lots of ants underneath all those little leaf pieces. They'll, they'll cut big pieces of leaves and haul them back to their hive or whatever we call their underground tunnels there. And, and um, like, like you would assume, early entomologists, people that saw the behavior automatically assumed they were cutting the leaves and hauling them off to, because that was food. Right? You assume that they were eating those pieces of leaves. Well, they come to find out that they're not eating the leaves at all. The ants are engaged in farming. They're actually farming underground. Have a crop that they're growing underground. You can see a bit of it right there. You see the white fuzzy stuff? They're chewing these leaves into a paste, into a pulp, that they then feed, are feeding to their underground garden of fungus. They then, when the fungus is matured sufficiently, they'll harvest it. You can see one of them, sorry, harvest little balls. You can see them harvesting some fungal right there and stacking up a bunch of fungal balls. Pretty cool stuff. Animals engaged in farming. But there's uh, other, other involvements too that you'll find shocking. There's, there's uh, ants that actually have pets or what you might say are engaged in animal husbandry. They're ants that are engaged in animal husbandry. Now, this cartoon's a few years old. It's become hard, become hard to teach for me because uh, in high school because the kids don't know my movie references anymore. I mean, you can't throw any movie references and have them recognize what you're talking about anymore. So even this one's too old. I'm going to have to replace it with a newer episode. But there was a, a Disney uh, um, animated movie called A Bug's Life a few years ago. And the, the, uh, the queen, the voiceover, per, was, that was Phyllis Diller, did the voiceover for the queen. But the queen had a little uh, pet that she called Afy. Well, what Afy is in reality is an aphid. And ants keep aphids. They keep them as a, not as a pet, but more as like, a, like I say, in a, a, the, as, a, as a herd animal that they would take out to pasture because that's what they're doing. They keep these aphids underground with them, caring for them underground. And then when, uh, when the temperature is right or when the season is good, you take your herd of aphids out to pasture, they'll walk, take them out on a walk to pasture, and they will, the aphids, they will drill into the plant with their uh, mouth part, proboscis, they drill in, with, suck some juice out with their proboscis, and then they exude it as a substance called honeydew that the ants eat. But they're, they're engaged in animal husbandry. They will, keep, they will care for the aphids off season and then take them back out when the springs return again. I mean, it's just amazing. There's also animals that, uh, ants that can do some amazing construction projects. But, it, and again, some significant construction projects and, and it exhibits this my hive mentality, but who's the boss? You know, who's the one? Someone's sure got to be. But these, these are called the leaf weaver ants. 
these uh, ants build a nest above ground where they get rained out all the time, right? Because you can't build your underground tunnels and area that's going to get rained on. Well, some, some ants know, know that they're the grabbers. They need to grab and hold those leaves in place. Others know that they're the gluers. They go, they go get their glue guns. They're uh, unwitting larvae. Next generation of, of uh, ants, their larvae are brought up and used as glue guns secrete a silken strand, and they will weave these leaves together. But again, who's the foreman on this construction site? Who tells these leaves, you guys are the ones, you guys are the fasteners, and you guys are the gluers, and, and you guys go get the water. You guys are the water boys. I mean, who, who tells them what to do? It's what we describe as hive mentality. They, everyone seems to know their job and knows when to do it and how to do it and when they're supposed to start. All of that seems to be communicated somehow, but this is one of the big mysteries in animal behavior is, is animal communication. Now, we, we've, uh, well, lots of forms of animal communication have been uh, recognized, but none of them are understood. Um, we could describe there's visual displays. Dance competitions have, are observed in many of your field hens. Your birds of paradise do uh, dance competitions like you've never seen. Audio signals like from bullfrogs or uh, warning calls from monkeys. Uh, uh, some animals make vocalizations that are unique to their individual. Think about your aquatic mammals like your, uh, you know, like your, uh, you know big humpback whales or your dolphins, but some of their calls are unique to the individual. So there's a species specificity there, but there's also an individual, an individual specific song that some of them seem to make. Others communicate through pheromones, through chemicals we call uh, pheromones. Uh, some of your ants lay out trails and these kind of things this way. And for others, it's very touch or tactile based. They have these little petty palps, little antennas, and they'll come up touching each other with these antennas. And, and and it, it, there's clearly communication, visual communications, flashing lights at each other for uh, like some of your cephalopods, your, your squids, they flash complex color patterns at each other that are, are still untranslated. Well, we know animals are communicating, but the big mystery though is how? How are they communicating? We know they are. There's too much information there that's being di uh, displayed for it not to be some kind of communication. But there's only one that we've been able to translate so far, and that's this one. This is called the waggle dance of the honeybee. When this was first observed, it was thought to be a mating dance. Because a lot of animals, your birds in particular, will do complex dances to show everyone who's the biggest and strongest and who has the best colors. And that. So it was assumed this was a mating dance until it was realized that this was a scout bee that had returned from scouting out food and in fact was communicating the location of the food to, this, to its, the hive. Well, the information portion of the dance is, uh, is, is communicated in the straight run, where it makes a little straight run, where the, the dancer vigorously vibrates or waggles her abdomen back and forth and emits some strong buzzes, some vibrations can be heard, some audible buzzes. The angle uh, of the straight line is, describes the direction of the flower patch in relation to the sun's position. So the angle of the, you know, of the dance is a direction related to the sun's position. The distance is precisely communicated by the length of the waggle, where one second equals one kilometer. So they're communicating the exact distance to the flower patch, the direction of the flower patch, and it's believed that the audible buzzes may be communicating the type or quality of the food yet unknown for, with, for certainty. But if the bees are communicating complex and specific information like this, what must the higher mammals be communicating? I mean, mammals, now, the insects like your bees and ants don't even have a brain. They don't even have a structure that we would call a brain. It's just a ganglia, a cluster of nerve cell bodies are up in the head, but nothing that we really would call a brain. They don't have a brain and yet, you know, a, communicating such complex information as this. Well, 
I kind of just want to focus on some amazing things that God made within the animals as kind of a, again, uh, helping us to better appreciate who our Father is. And so we're going to be covering some of that this week and then when I'm up again next month as well. Well, let me start with uh, just a few cool examples. Recently, scientists at the University of Cambridge discovered a remarkable design feature in these tiny little insects called leaf hoppers. And this was just reported in the journal Cell in 2013. Now, this thing jumps as its primary mode of movement and does so over incredible distances and speeds, thought to be exceeding uh, 600 G-forces during its, during its actual jump. Well, as such, a mechanism to carefully control the firing of its two legs is, is necessary because if one of the legs fired just momentarily before the other, it was sent it into what was called a yaw rotation. It would just spin out of control. So to accomplish this, these precision jumps, the, the leaf hopper was designed with hind leg joints with gears and curved cog-like strips of opposing teeth that intermesh and rotate just like the mechanical gears that we make. The lead researcher at the University of Cambridge was a guy named Malcolm Burroughs. He stated, states this, the gears in the Isis hind leg bear remarkable engineering resemblance to those found on every bicycle and inside every car gearbox. He continues, each gear tooth has a rounded corner at the point it connects to the gear strip, a feature identical to man-made gears such as bicycle gears. Essentially, it's a shock absorbing mechanism to stop teeth from shearing off. The gear teeth on the opposing hind leg lock together like those in a car gearbox ensuring almost complete synchronicity and leg movement. Malcolm Burroughs describing the technology that's been discovered. But of course, this extraordinary ex illustration of God's design in the animal world is dismissed as an evolutionary artifact. Malcolm Burrell states this, these gears are not designed, they're evolved, representing high speed and precision machinery evolved for synchronization in the animal world. Now in the article, he talks over and over about designed and designs and the design feature in engineering, but he then he comes out with this statement. These gears are not designed, they're evolved, or representing high speed and precision machining evolved for synchronization in the animal world. Why would he say such a thing when he's talked on and so so much about design? Why does he throw in a statement like this? Well, this is what you have to do to get published today. See, especially if you're publishing on research that you've done that illustrates a design feature in, the, in God's kingdom, the animal world here in this case, you better make sure that everyone understands you're not talking about real designs because real designs come from a designer. Real engineering comes from an engineer. And you start pointing out design features that you better make sure that the review board knows you're talking about an evolved uh, engineering or design that was just evolved. It just looks like designs, but it's not in fact real designs. Better make sure they understand that or you won't get published today. <laughs> well, more than any other feature in the animal kingdom, uh, the ability to fly has caused us to marvel at the animals. And I, and I say marvel because, uh, you know, f l travel has always been very laborious laborious for us, very laborious to travel any great distance, any number of miles in a day is very laborious, but the, the flying animals can do so, so effortlessly and so gracefully. Whether it's the smallest insect or the largest soaring bird, the ability of animals to fly has been a source of great awe and envy. They move with such grace and elegance and traverse such great distances with ease. A bird can effortlessly glide or catch a thermal and ride it skyward. But again, for us, traveling has always been very laborious, especially over rough terrain or elevation gain. Well, insect flight in particular has been a long standing mystery because many are quite large and for the size of their rings, uh, the, for the size of their wings, their wings beat incredibly fast. We're talking just on average, somewhere in the ballpark of 200 beats per second. 
Now think about that, 200 beats per second, that's kind of generally what you're looking at in insects. There's a variation, variation there, but 200 beats per second. So think about a, a mosquito, you've heard a mosquito. People have had mosquitoes get close enough to their ear to hear what that thing sounds like. That high-pitched whine, that's the, that's the sound of 200 wing beats per second. 200 flaps in a single second. And well, that was the case, that's the, also the case for the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the bee. Uh, and, it, and, and in fact, in 1934, a famous entomologist calculated that the bee, that bee flight was aerodynamically impossible because they're so large. The bee is an incredi incredibly large insect for the size of its wings, and its wings beat around the same, around the same speed as an insect, a, a much smaller insect like your fruit flies. But the, but the, the, the honeybee is, is like 80 times larger, and yet its wings beat the same rate as a fruit flies, like 80, uh, 230 beats per second. Well, ultimately, the secret behind insect flight was answered by some, uh, by some researchers, and it was discovered that they are creating little mini vortices, little mini tornadoes at the leaning edges of their wings, which gives them lift. More recently, bees have been shown to use an even more complex process. Researchers at uh, Caltech found that the bee flight is made possible by a, a rapid rotation of the wing as it flips over when it's reversing direction. They concluded that this rotation during stroke reversal is responsible for most of the upward force during hovering. Well, our motivation for studying God's designs is in part uh, d due to the hope that we could copy these abilities. I can say the travel has always been very laborious for us, and we watch those birds flying with in great envy, that is for sure. Well, Leonardo da Vinci, shown here, is most famous for his art, such as the Mona Lisa, the Lord's Supper, but he was also a scientist and an engineer. For much of his life, Leonardo da Vinci was fascinated by the phenomena of bird flight, producing many studies and culminating in his Codex on the Flight of Birds that was published in 1505. He said this, a bird is an instrument operating through mechanical laws, which instrument it is in the capacity of man to be able to make with all of its motions. So he decided he'd going to make a bird. In an attempt to make his flying machine, da Vinci drew up several different plans, including a, a screw-shaped helicopter, a hang glider, a parachute, and this machine that you see there, which he called his great bird. Many, uh, many of his designs were impractical for the building materials that were available of the day, but the, the wing design is it was a good design. This is what it would look like without uh, the fabric. But at this point in time, you're talking about wood and heavy canvas, and people just don't have the stamina that would be necessary to keep something like this aloft. It was designed so you would lay down on the platform and then uh, push on the bars. You don't see them really well. Push on the bars with your feet to, uh, to flap the wings. Well, like I say, uh, with, with, the, uh, the building, with the materials available at the time, it, was, uh, it could not fly, but they did come back and remake it with modern materials and a motor and were able to get it to, to lift. So the design was, uh, was in fact good. Well, this practice, the practice of studying God's creations and using them to develop or improve our own designs has been a hugely important part of human technological advance. We could point to countless things that we currently use in our lives that were developed through what we call biomimicry, mimicking life. For example, Velcro. Most people, I think, know that Velcro was eventually uh, invented after studying burrs, or what those stickers look like. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I ever mentioned that these were my dogs back here, but uh, no longer with me. They all uh, eventually died of old age, but I'm telling you, uh, 
in, in New Mexico and West Texas, where, uh, where I started my little uh, colony of, of dogs, you take one of those things out for a, a walk in a vacant lot someplace, and you can come back with the dog's coat just absolutely covered in burrs, covered in those little stickers. And I had to cut those things out on, on many occasion because they each each of the spine of these uh, that that this burr makes is is a uh, hooks in a different direction so once the thing gets up in there it's just hooking onto hairs in all kinds of different directions Jenny and just literally have to cut them out but we've uh, we developed velcro after studying what the burrs look like after uh, after a bit of study they they come to realize why termites build, build termite mounds I mean, what, a lot of effort made to build that mound instead of just uh, digging the dirt out of the ground. And once they, when, when they finally uh, get, uh, started exploring this, they realized it was because it kept it nice and cool inside. And so now we're, de we're designing buildings after studying termite mounds. There was one, uh, the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe was built specifically after studying the termite mounds. They would uh, systematically opening and closing vents and then allowing convection to carry your hot air out. So it was a, it's a good design. We're now using that to design buildings. Shark skin has been heavily studied and now we're using it to design swimwear. They come to realize that a shark could just give one kick of its tail and uh, seems to be able to slice through water with almost no resistance. And uh, after studying its, its scales, they started de designing swimwear with the same capability. Gecko ge are reptiles that can not only crawl up wall, walk up walls, but can also walk along the inside of a ceiling. And after some studies, it was they came to uh, uh, discover that they have microscopic hairs on the pads of their feet, which uh, creates a massive amount of electrostatic forces. Think about uh, like when you rub a balloon on your hair and then you can get it to stick to a wall. Well, those are electrostatic forces. And if you multiply this a million times by creating microscopic hairs on those touch points, you can get something pretty heavy to stick to walls. And so now we're designing adhesive surfaces instead of using glues, which can be toxic, or their production produces toxic byproducts that they just use the microscopic hairs instead. We've also uh, um, have started modifying the, the fan blades for these big turbine for turbines after studying humpback whale fins. They come to realize that all the humpback whales have notched fins. And it seemed to be par part of a design feature, so they studied it. And sure enough, at very slow movements, slow rates of, uh, of uh, slow velocities, they have much, much more power, much more force with the notch fins than they do uh, with those that are smooth. Um, morphing airplane wings is something that's caught the attention of uh, engineers after heavy studies of bird wings and, and robotics has a long drawn from studies of uh, insects or mammals, even movies like Star Wars drew from uh, the, the way elephants walk to, to make up one of their huge robots. Well, I wanted you to listen to how a scientist describes this practice. Now, this is a researcher from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, one of our big city-sized laboratories that we have in this country. I found this on their talking glossary of genetics terms, and it's a telling uh, definition of what biomimicry is. This is a sound-based. Biomimicry is the process of understanding the designs and materials we find in biology and adapting them for human use. So over the millions and millions of years of evolution, there's tremendous wisdom and efficiency biological systems. Mm -hmm. So let's look at what he says there. Biomimicry is the process of understanding the designs we find in biology, and they recognize that there's tremendous wisdom and efficiency in these biological systems. They recognize that there's design, and they recognize that there's wisdom behind that design. So why can't they, why can't they see it? I, I mean, there's behind designs, there's a designer. Behind engineering, there's an engineer. And behind wisdom, there's a mind. Why can't they see it? I mean, there's overwhelming 
conflicting evidence of design out there. God made the world intentionally that way. Paul reminds us in Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, na namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, per clearly perceived, ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, that there was a creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Well, that is the nature of science today, what we call natural science. Everyone understands that there is a God. You understand that, that there, this place did not just magically come into existence. It's too bizarrely perfect and too bizarrely beautiful. This planet that we live on just shouldn't be here. You, everyone can see this, but, but they don't want to believe it. See, they want to believe what the, the lie the, that the father of lies has, has, has cooked up for people. Because, you know, natural science is teaching a terrible lie. They want to believe, people to believe that this world just formed all on its own, magically somehow, and they're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. Because see, with such a belief, life is comfortable. I, they know that there's a God. They know this place didn't just form all by itself. No evidence has been presented to them to prove to them that that was the case, but they want to believe it. They want to believe it because it's a terrifying way to live otherwise. It's terrifying. To, if, you, if you are not a Christian, but you believe that there's a God out there that created all of this, and you don't know that God, that's a terrifying way to live. A constant fear about being judged when you die, knowing what you've done. It's a terrifying way to live. And so people want to believe the lie. It doesn't take much to convince them, but God has made the world full of amazing and beautiful things. And uh, as we got off, get off into our cur coverage a little more about animals, I, I hope that I can impress upon you that with, that with that. Mainly what we're gonna be sticking with are more examples of biomimicry, more examples of technologies that have been developed after discovering some really cool things that were, that were found right there within God's designs. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for the animals that bring such, such joy to our lives, to the dogs and the cats that we love so much, that we love to cuddle and snuggle and pet. and We love the, the warmth that they give us, the love that they bring to our household, Father, and, and we know you made those things for us because you love us so much that you made those for us and you gave them to us because you wanted us to be happy here and to have things that we would enjoy. Father, we see your love in this place and we thank you for your love. We see your love and the beauty that surrounds us, the beauty of the sunsets, the, the clouds, the beauty of the animals, the colors, Praise you, Father, and we thank you for this wonderful world. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Go with us, Lord, and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.